I probably all I knew about cycling was people rode their bike into work and uh, the Tour de France. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Anna Dravinsky and you're watching Ride to Unite by We Love Cycling. Today, I'm interviewing Instagram sensation Orla Walsh, all about her transformation from wild party girl to national level cyclist. So I think one of the first things I want to ask you is if we go back five years or so or a little bit more, what did you actually think of cyclists before you'd got into it at all yourself? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. What did I think of cyclists? Um, to be honest, I didn't really, I, I didn't have much exposure to cyclists. Um, I didn't really know any other than my dad. And my dad was a cyclist at the time. But thinking back on it, it's funny because I, I had, um, I never talked to him about it. I had expressed absolutely no interest in what he did on the bike. Um, I knew he had a bike and yeah. that was about all I knew. But during that time, he was racing. He was doing stuff at, at the local uh, velodrome in Sundrive. And um, yeah, he was well into bikes for about five years prior to when I got into it. Um, but in terms of what I thought about cyclists, I probably all I knew about cycling was people rode their bike into work and uh, the Tour de France. <laughs> <laughs> so it just didn't capture your imagination at all at the time? Absolutely no interest. But I had no interest in any sport at the time. Um, I think the last time I participated in any kind of sport would have been back when I was about 13 or 14 in school. I played hockey and I, I dabbled in basketball and a few other things. And I think just around 14, 15, I fell out of uh, love with any sport. Um, and yeah, it was like that for 10 years. I genuinely thought sport was stupid and I know people are going to be like, what? I, I didn't, I didn't see the point of it. Um, I, you know, I didn't exercise. So I obviously didn't understand the benefits that you get from sport and how much fun participating in a sport can be. Um, I just didn't get it. So yeah, five years ago, sport was not on my radar. Cyclists, not a clue. No. <laughs> I mean, so if someone had said to you, you're going to be a national champion and a champion of cycling, would you have even believed them? No, not, <laughs> not a hope. Not a hope. Sure, I was smoking 20 cigarettes a day, um, it, going, drinking heavily regularly. Um, I was the, the, as far away from a national champion as you can get, I suppose. <laughs> and so from that point of view, you know, from that person who knew nothing about bikes, what are some of the weirdest things that you've now that you now do that you've completely accepted as normal that actually a previous version of yourself would have been like, what on earth is that? Um, probably just walking around in Lycra, <laughs> walking around in uh, shoes with cleats on them. Um, yeah, I mean, cyclists probably do a lot of weird things, <laughs> keeping all your food and your snacks in your back pocket. Um, <laughs> Yeah, weird things. I suppose cyclists um, are just weird in general, aren't they? Um, but I got I got so into it straight from the from the go once I was introduced to the bike. So I straight away signed up to everything. You know, I wanted I wanted the, the nice kit. I wanted um, a nice bike. I'd be researching different shoe types, helmets. So I you know I threw myself in the deep end once I was exposed to my honestly my first cycle into work. So. And your, and so your mindset changed as well, looking at these things rather than seeing, say, Lycra as weird. You actually, because you just said then, like, nice kit. Yeah. That, it would only be considered nice, I suppose, if you're in on it. Already. If you're in it, yeah. No, I completely bought into the whole thing. Um, I remember in the, in the early days, I was, you know, in work researching. I probably don't tell my boss, but yeah, researching a uh, nice kit while I was, you know, at the, at the desk, at my office desk. Um, and... I, I, I feel like a lot of cyclists are in that boat. You get so into the culture and the the way of life, I suppose, and you want to be a part of this community. And it's, it there is, um, I don't know, there is a heavy um, focus on, yeah, equipment and kit. And it, I, probably that's not ideal either because you want it to just be about the sport. But that was the first thing that I learned was, oh, I need to get new shoes or <laughs> I need to get a nicer bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they all count they all count towards the overall performance and the overall image so that first foray into cycling what what was it what was it for you 
Um, so my dad suggested that I start commuting in and out of town. At the time, I, I think I was getting the bus in and out. Uh, I didn't have a car, so a bike would have been the easiest way to just get in and out. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to Dublin, but the traffic in the morning, it's probably the same in the UK, is just an absolute nightmare. So he gave me his old um, bike. I can't even remember the brand of it. Uh, it was just a, it was an, it was a nice enough entry level road bike. And um, yeah, he, he escorted me in and out of town uh, one of the first days back in 2015. And yeah, it was, I couldn't believe how easy it was. Was that, that was my first initial response was, wow, it only, it only took me 20 minutes to get from my house to my desk. Why haven't I been doing this all the time? <laughs> and it's free. And it's free. Yeah, it was yeah. fun and it was free. Well, well once you've got the bike, it, that is. And your dad, so he helped you choose an entry level road bike, thought that was the best way for you to go. And did that feel comfortable? You didn't feel strange it was actually, or difficult it, to it, adjust? It was his old bike. So me and my dad are quite similar heights. So, um, you know, it had been used, it was, it was a fine bike, and it was a safe bike. Um, but he was funny at the beginning, he, he didn't tell me that you could swap out the pedals. So it, there were clip, clip in pedals, obviously on the bike. <laughs> so on day one. He, from day one, he told me that I had to use them. <laughs> so I was like, okay, fair enough. Um, so I went ahead and bought a cheap pair of, you know, Velcro, I think they were Velcro DHB, um, off wiggle or something um yeah. shoes for 20 quid and yeah straight first day off I think we went out like the day before just so I could learn how to clip in and out and then it was straight away in th into town through the keys and that is throwing me in the deep end because the keys with traffic and it's already like notoriously dangerous to cycle into town <laughs> and I was there first day off clipped into this bike um so, but I was fine. I didn't crash. It made me learn quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, but there are tricks and, and good tips to, to know when you're cycling in traffic as well, though, in order to keep yourself safer. So how did yeah. you develop that side of your skill set? Well, it, it, I can thank my dad for that because he, you know, he escorted me in for the first few days. Um, and he would have been commuting in and out for a few years prior to that. So he knew, you know, you know, how to, you know, navigate through traffic and obviously try not get hit by buses and taxis <laughs> that seems to be the main you know hazard along along the road into town is um you're cycling along this bus lane but um yeah it can be quite busy in the morning so uh, i just followed his lead uh there were a couple of times where he he might have make, made some dangerous moves but um i was still able to kind of you know maneuver my way through cars and follow him and uh, probably not an ideal uh safe way to cycle in but uh it uh, it it upped my skills i suppose getting me ready for for bunch racing which oh happened. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it seemed to go quite quickly really from that didn't it you're doing your commute yeah. to work and then what prompted you to join a cycling club and think actually i could do this more than a, just as a mode of transport yeah, I, I'd say I was commuting for about a year before I'd really bought into everything and I was enjoying it. I was doing it most days that I decided, OK, I'd like to do more of this. I'd like to do it at the weekends as well. And uh, again, my dad encouraged me to join a, a cycling club. So uh, Orwell Wheelers was the first one on the list. It, it came up um, basically because it had a, quite a large women's um, membership. I think it's, so. some of the local clubs around where I live had a cycling club, but there was no women. So I kind of felt like I wanted to join a club where there would be other women and I could learn a bit more from them. Because it can be a bit intimidating, especially if you have never been on a group ride to rock up and it's, it's just all men. Yeah. Um, so I joined Orwell Wheelers in 2016 and straight off the bat, I loved it. And of course everyone there was straight away saying you should try racing so um yeah a, a year into commuting then i joined a club and pretty much a month after i joined the club i entered myself into my first road race <laughs> so, 
And that enthusiasm, had they spotted a talent or was it just that they were all so into it so they were like, come on, join us, you want to um, I think, I think because I, I, I'm going to be blaming my dad for everything, but he'll be delighted. Um, he, he, so you know when you join a club, they might have different levels of groups that go out. So there was the white group, the yellow group, the orange group, and the black group who were the, the racers. Oh, they labeled it um, as I've not heard that. That's cute. Yeah, they color code them. Um, so my dad said, I hadn't done any group riding, but that, that I was fast enough, I was strong, and I should go in the, art, the second fastest group. So I went out with them on my first group ride and got around for a three hour ride. Fine. I think I might have got a bit dropped on any hill, <laughs> which, <laughs> which becomes a theme. Um, but I, I kept going at it and, and they figured, well, geez, you've just started um, cycling and you're getting around okay in the, in the faster group. So maybe you should try racing. So I, I could blame Orla Hendren on that as well. Orla is, she's head of the Women's Commission in Orwell Wheeler. So she, um, she definitely was one of the first people on board to um, <laughs> encourage me to start racing. And, and then, yes, a month later, I was rocking up to a, a 40 kilometer flat uh, open road race and uh, man like I didn't know what I was doing I, I, sh I showed up about five minutes before the race started and obviously you know yourself when you go to a race you you show up two hours before you sign on you warm up none of that just showed up said well the race is at you know 11 so I'll show up at 11. Um, luckily the commissar felt sorry for me so he gave me my number anyway and off I went but um, it, it actually turned out that I finished third in that race. And that the only reason for that, I would say, is because I felt comfortable riding a bunch. It was flat and it came, it, it was short and it came to a sprint at the end. Um, and at the time, I didn't realize what kind of rider I was. Um, but I just remember thinking, oh, there's the finish line. I'm going to sprint. <laughs> and it <laughs> worked out well. Uh, so... Yeah, I mean, the, the following race after that, you know, I got a bit of a false confidence from that race and thought, oh, geez, I must be, uh, I was really good at this. <laughs> uh, uh, no. So the next race was one of the first in the national series and that involved quite a lot of climbing. And I think the first hill we got to, I was uh, very um, aggressively spat out the back and I don't think I even finished. I didn't finish that race. I got dropped and... I think I, yeah, just, I got in the, the broom wagon or whatever they call it. <laughs> straight, straight into a national race and you're... Yeah, it was, it was stupid, but I, um, you know, that's, that exposed me to the whole scene. Um, I, re I honestly didn't know that women race bikes, just in general, uh, never mind in Ireland. Because um, really the only time I'd ever seen bike racing was the Tour de France and I know that's obviously a big issue with um getting more women and girls into cycling is that you don't see it you don't you don't you don't see it on tv you don't really see it anywhere so um yeah for me to see that there was a scene here in Ireland of women racing bikes I just thought it was so cool <laughs> and, <is it laughs> and I wanted to do it more scene? is there a big community of you it's it's quite small. Well, it was even four years ago. It was it's small, but it's gotten much bigger. You're just seeing a lot more younger girls getting into it these days. Um, obviously, I've only been around for the last couple of years, so I'm not really sure on the the longer history of women's cycling, especially in Ireland. But um, it's it seems that there are more more women getting into it. Even the club that I would have joined here locally um, in Castlenock didn't have any women two years ago and now it's got 50 women signed up for now for the club so yeah like there's, there's just more women I think just getting on bikes um and Cycling Ireland as well ran a online training program uh you know this year they, they'd done it twice and I think some of the sessions had hundreds of women across Ireland signed up to these um training sessions on zoom so that, that in itself is great that there's just there seems to be a growing interest in in cycling in Ireland uh, and in women uh, women doing it so that's that's good to see you know maybe some of those women will come out of it um wanting to try racing as well so do you have I mean not expecting you to be an expert on this but do you have any personal theories as to why that might be growing in the way that it is 
That's a good question. Why might it be growing? Um, I, I think just the, the general, in general, the bike scene seems to be growing, especially just in the last year. Um, and in the last couple of years, you know, you have the bike to work scheme here in Ireland, so you can get a tax reduction on buying a bike. So you do see more people in general, and that obviously includes women just riding their bikes. Um, I think encouragement as well in clubs about trying to get more women, trying to have, you know, equal numbers of men and women in clubs. I think that all helps. Um, but yeah, it seems to be moving in the right direction. And would you say maybe there's a word of mouth element to it as well? The more women that get into it, the more they tell their friends. Because it sounds like it was actually women that encouraged you to do that first race yeah. and to get involved in it. So you're creating that community. And then presumably yeah. you'll talk to some friends or to other people online on Instagram. And then that will encourage them to give it a go. Yeah, I think that's part of it too. I mean, I'm, I've tried many times to get some of my friends on bikes, but... Uh, <laughs> Some of them are very re re resistant to that. Um, I think I think there's a, a sense that cycling can be quite dangerous. I think a lot of women are a bit intimidated by it. Um, it probably takes a certain type of person to want to race bikes as well. It's not exactly um, a, a run in the park, shall we say. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little more intense than that. So, um, you know, just to get more women cycling is great. Uh, and hopefully out of that, you'll get the few that want to, to try competing as well. And do you find that now that you are part of this new world, that's where your friendship group is? Do you feel like you're part of a community? 100%, yeah. And now that I'm part of, you know, the national squad as well, that's it's like, it's like my new family. Um, yeah, there's a huge sense of community when it comes to cycling. I think I found that from day one, just that real, there, I found it very welcoming. And I just enjoyed that there was a bunch of other people who all enjoyed the same thing. And who doesn't like, you know, being up in the mountains and going for coffees and cakes at the weekend on your bike? Like, who doesn't like that? <laughs> I loved it. Me too. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. And so what do you, you know, you say you couldn't convince some of your previous friends to get on a bike. Mm -hmm. What do they think of it all? What do they see of your new life? Uh, for some reason, some of them aren't that surprised. I've always been quite extreme in everything that I do. So when, when they saw that I'd started cycling, of course, I was going to try and take it the whole way. <laughs> They're just like, oh, this is Orla. She's just being Orla. Um, I don't know how to describe it any other way, but they, they, weren't, um, they weren't necessarily surprised that I kept pushing this and kept trying to get the most out of myself when it came to cycling. Because once I... Once I really like something and I'm kind of obsessive about things, um, I really try and get the most out of myself uh, when, when, I, when I want something. So yeah. yeah, obsessive is probably how I approach most things in life. So that, that was the same for cycling. By the looks of it online as well, those previous friends come from a life where you're quite an obsessive party girl. Yeah. That was like a huge, I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure what you're hoping to achieve. Like it's not, I don't know if there's steps or levels that you can go up within partying, but. No, I don't know. I just went full whack with that. <laughs> like how far can I push this? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I, that was just a, years and years of, pushing my body to its absolute limit when it, in, in an unhealthy way. Um, yeah, looking back, obviously I made, they were the choices that I wanted to make at the time. And uh, I, I don't like to say well, I regretted it because that was just part of me being me and my growth through life. Um, and it is what it is. My friends were still there through the, the thick and thin of it. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what, I mean, just describe a little bit of what that, that lifestyle looked like for you. Um, the classic party girl, I suppose. I, uh, I mean, it started back when I was a teenager, I guess. It was smoking, started smoking, started drinking in fields with, you know, my mates. We called it, uh, yeah. I don't know if I can say it. We called it knacker drinking <laughs> when you're drinking out of the field. <laughs> yeah. I don't know I if that's a say We've all been there, but I don't know yeah, about yeah. that knacker drinking thing. I'm yeah, like, yeah. That's what they call it here. Um, and yeah, so we, yeah, I mean, moving on from that, I guess I uh, moved into college life and that kind of made it even easier for me because I had a job at that point as well, part time. So I could just, I spent all my money on 
going out. Um, but yeah, it was it was kind of a case that it wasn't just one night every so often. Sometimes it would be every single night, and um, some some nights none of my friends would be going out. I remember one night no one was going out, but I really wanted to go out, so I just went out by myself. <laughs> I was living in a town at that time, so I would just go buy a bottle of vodka, get drunk, go out meet randomers and then they, they were my new friends for the night that was like how much I needed to go out I would just go out by myself um so yeah that continued for several years um probably all sorts of mixes of different substances as well it was just it was not not good for my body or my mind um and then it was only yeah it was only really 24 25 when I started to I don't know move away from that and then just it seemed to be at the same time that I started cycling into work. So, and then I suddenly became obsessed with this, with cycling. Do you, think, you, do you think you were looking for an out in a way? Maybe, yeah. It, it kind of that lifestyle was part of my identity for so long and I needed something else to focus on, I suppose. That's just sort of how my mind works. I, you know, that, that was all I knew. I didn't know really I didn't know any other way of life, uh, this healthy life that wasn't me. I'm not sporty. I'm not, you know, uh, how, you know, I didn't see myself in that way. So then I went to find something that I really enjoyed and then started believing that I could be good at that as well. That really, yeah, it was probably, it's probably what saved me from that. <laughs> and was it, was it an all or nothing? Was it just like a switch of a button and all of a sudden you weren't drinking and you weren't smoking? Or was there like a, a phase you know, phasing out of it all. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't an all or nothing with that. I did, I mean, I still, I think the smoking, I pretty much gave up straight away. I, um, I, I think I'd been, I'd been looking for a reason to stop and a good a reason as any is I'd like to be better at cycling my bike and you can't be very good at that if you're puffing away on a cigarette. (laughs) Um, so that gave, gave that up pretty much straight away. Um, the drinking, I, the drinking probably continued every so often. I might have a blowout. I, I'm not saying I've been perfect over the last few years. There's been a few times where I've definitely overdone it. <laughs> um, but I've been pretty much completely, I think, I don't want to say complete, I might've had one glass of wine this year, but uh, this year I've pretty much been completely sober. Um, so yeah, that it's got to the point now that I've absolutely no interest in drinking. Um, partially because the hangovers are so 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 much worse when you're in your thirties. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> it is so oh, worth it. Shame. No. <laughs> like I could have a hangover for three days, and I'm just I'm not about that life. <laughs> yeah, it's really sad, isn't it? When you're like, oh, yeah. you're having a drink, and you're already thinking like, oh, I don't it's know, gonna yeah. feel like the next day. <laughs> Yeah. Be, like jumping one step ahead but do you not like fancy a party every now and again to celebrate some of your big cycling achievements um yeah I guess the I don't know the appeal of drinking has just gone from my life I uh sometimes I think about oh wouldn't it be nice just to you know let my hair down and relax and have a few drinks but um I, I find that the that the next day and like anxiety related to just drinking too much I, is not worth the relaxing uh, effects that it has when you're drinking um I, I just don't like how it how it affects my mind and my body the next day so I just I could I go out I, I would go out and celebrate but maybe without any alcohol that's what I was going to ask are there like you've had some big cycling goals achieved you know we're going to yeah. that a little bit later on but just, like how would you celebrate those now just with my family, my friends, food. Yeah. I love food. Just go and eat loads of food. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> go and talk to my friends. Go relax. Just enjoy yourself. I guess you don't need to to drink to have a good time. <laughs> yeah, and be surrounded by the people who care about that journey. Yeah, and exactly, you. and celebrate it together. They can have a few drinks. <laughs> nice. That's really nice. Yeah. But um, to have got to where you are now, it's always a bit of a surprise because I've read that your first season, really, that one that you talked about already, didn't go fantastically well for you. No, no. Um, my well, my first race, my first race was that flat race, as I said, 
Um, so that that went well. I came third. I thought, wow, this is great. Um, I found something that I'm really good at. Uh, but the the next race and the following races were just awful. They were. I basically entered into all the national series races in Ireland, and I got dropped in pretty much all of them. I'd say. I, I don't, I'm not sure if I finished another one that season. Um, but in saying that, uh, Orla Hendren from Orwell Wheelers was encouraging me to do these uh, midweek crit type racing in Corky Park. So they have, um, it's an it's a enclosed circuit, uh, safe, there's no cars. Uh, so it's really good for, you know, practicing bunch skills and cornering. And I would do that on a Tuesday evening just to learn a bit more and they, they would divide it between the A racers and the B racers. So I got to race with other women who were newer. Um, so that could build up a bit of confidence. And yeah, I just, I, I loved that because I was racing with women kind of the same standard as me and it was fast, it was flat, there were no hills. Um, but yeah, I would still come, I would still head to the road races at the weekends um, expecting it's funny because I look back and I, I kept going expecting to be better, even though I wasn't training. You, do you know what I mean? Like I didn't have a training plan and I was still working full time, and I, but I still rock up to these races expecting a better result. <laughs> um, and it was only at the end of that season, looking at the whole, my whole season, that I figured, right, I think I need to have a, a training plan uh, or I'm, it's going to be the same next year. So I got a, a coach. I think I got a coach just at the end of that winter of 2016. And I also started training over the winter with uh, a, some local guys who raced like uh, lower level, like half four, you know? And um, so I started training with them and uh, yeah, I think, I think that really helped getting some structure on my training and then getting a coach who knew a bit more about race, but I didn't know anything about racing. So, you know, you need to learn about positioning and know the course. Uh, things like simple things, because we've discovered I'm not a good climber. So <laughs> try and be near the front of the bunch when the hill's coming, know where the, know where the hills are. Things like that, that I wouldn't have even considered. Uh, so the next season was when I started getting some um, minor results. I, I got a few podiums. And, and then I got a win in a road race, which I was delighted with. Um, so yeah, uh, and it was basically from that year, 2017, uh, that there was a talent transfer program as well in Cycling Ireland. And I applied for that. And yeah, Jesus, I don't want to bore you with all the details, but. <laughs> I, go for was, it. I mean, it's yeah. not, to really, to most people, we've not been through this. Most people have not managed to get onto their national squads. So yeah, I was just lo uh, lucky. It was a good timing. It was, um, it was also me probably being a bit pushy because the, the description of the talent transfer was you need to have competed at a national level in another sport, which I had not. But I sent an email anyway and said, I would love to be tested because I've just started cycling. You know, I've only just got a coach and I have A, B or C, whatever results that minor results that I'd had on the road. Um, I don't think I'd won anything at that point. I honestly think maybe it, I, should, I should really find the email at some point. But I was like, I think I said, like, I came fifth in you know, a race that might have only had 10 people in it. Um, <laughs> but I... Um, they brought me in for testing anyway, and I, I didn't have any expectations. I was, it was more, I was curious to see, um, you know, how I ranked against real talent. Um, so I, uh, I, had, I didn't know what to expect. I just said, I'll, I'd love to just know what the numbers are. And so they tested me and yeah, long story short, uh, I think there was a hundred applicants or they tested a hundred and then they reselected about 40 women for a, a six week uh, training period where they test you again at the end of the six weeks. Um, so I got through those rounds and, and then the, the retest, I got through that round and they picked eight, uh, eight athletes out of that. So I was in the, the, the top eight then for this um, program, which basically focused on team pursuit 
uh, it was they were just trying to find women to ride and race uh, the women's team pursuit specifically um so yeah and then <laughs> god say it seems mad but at the end of that year then i raced a world cup <laughs> and <laughs> in team pursuit now we came last dead last um i didn't go, <laughs> didn't go to plan at all but we were there and um yeah so that was maybe a few months after i'd gone on a track bike for the first time on an indoor velodrome um I'd also broken my collarbone that year on the track as well. So it was like 2017 was uh, insane. Um, but, you know, it was, I wouldn't change any of it. Um, and it sounds then it was like a the, whirlwind. It was, 2017 was probably the craziest year. Uh, so much changed. And then 2018 was when I decided, listen, I'm going to go at this full whack. Because, um, you know, I had an opportunity to learn and train with Cycling Ireland for the team pursuit and I wanted to do it properly. So I... I left my job and <laughs> relocated to Majorca. Um, I, I have mentioned this, but there's no velodrome in Ireland. So we were having to travel over to Majorca. Um, we train on the velodrome in Palma there. I didn't so, actually realise that. No, yeah, so we, you know, there's no velodrome in Ireland. They've been talking about building one for what, 20 years probably. Um, so yeah, we, so I was using my, my leave, my work leave to go to these training camps, um, with no guarantee that I was going to end up getting selected, but I thought I might as well give it a hundred percent that, you know, I'd regret not, not giving it my all. Um, and it's worked out in the end, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, here you are. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that takes quite a bit of financial courage as well to just jump out of a job you know, maybe it's something yeah. that 16 or 17 year olds might think about, but you know, you're further, further ahead in your career than that. So did you fall back on some family support? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm lucky. I mean, I am privileged in that I do have a safety net if anything happens, not everybody has that privilege. Um, but no, I have done it off my own back for the most part. I had, I had savings from, yeah. from my job. Um, now in saying that, I was still living at home when I worked. Not everybody can do that either. So I didn't have a massive amount of bills. Um, and, and then the Instagram kind of coincided with, with that. So I was lucky to find some brands that wanted to support me. Um, so there was some financial support there. Um, yeah, and different brand deals here and there. It's, it's enough, like it's, it's not a glam life. It's enough, to, <laughs> it's enough to get by. But I figured... You know, I have, I have a, I have a, um, a degree. I have a career already. So, it's this is something that's once in a lifetime opportunity, and I can go back to the office job afterwards. And I'm not doing this for money, obviously. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you know yeah. exactly. There's no other words for it. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity, and if you yeah. didn't take that. Yeah you'd be kicking yourself. Exactly, yeah. It really is. And I'm, I'm not getting any younger, so. <laughs> uh, so you just mentioned Instagram there, and, uh, you know, you've got a massive following on Instagram. You've been hugely successful. When did you start noticing that this was going to be something that was growing for you? Um, I, do you know what? So I, I had an Instagram account, like a personal one, before I started the cycling one, and... It was around the same time I was just learning about bikes and learning about kit and I'd been scrolling on Instagram and I'd see, uh, you know, women who were obviously getting sponsored <laughs> with different kits, like free kit. And I was like, oh, wow, save some money. I could do, I mean, I, was like, I could do that. Do that. <laughs> I do that. That looks pretty straightforward. Um, so I, I, it was partially that, but it was also partially, I wanted to share what I was doing with my cycling and I was boring the hell out of my friends and family with posting, you know, bike stuff on my own Instagram. So I decided you know, I'll make a cycling exclusive Instagram page. And so I did that. Now I didn't think, I didn't think it was going to grow to the, to the size that it has grown, but I loved sharing bike stuff every day. So I think, cause obviously Instagram's work, you need to put mm -hmm. content out regularly. You need to engage with people. You need to be consistent with it. And I just naturally 
liked doing that and I wanted to share with people what I was doing. So it just came almost easy at the beginning. You know, I was taking pictures on my group rides, been like, yeah, I did, I did 80 kilometers today, <laughs> coffee spin. And people seemed to like that for some reason. I think they could sense uh, I was genuinely enthusiastic about it. Mm. Um, and, and then it was kind of maybe, oh, it wasn't even that long into it that I started getting reshared on various different pages. I'm not a huge fan of some of these pages, but like women on bikes. I was going to say, I think I know the types of pages you're going to, yeah. yeah. I used to get reshared then. I was like, okay, whatever. But that I would start seeing more numbers following me. Um, but I think it all really took off when I decided, and this was just on a whim, I came across a photo of me in 2015, which is also when I had, you know, started riding a bike, but I was, <laughs> I was drinking straight from a bottle of whiskey in the street. And so I thought that was funny because it came up with my memories. And now I was, you know, riding, racing bikes. So I did a, um, a comparison. And I said, yeah. like, just thinking, this is a funny comparison, and, now. and it just blew up. <laughs> um, people seem to really, I don't know, relate to that kind of transformation, I suppose, you know, bad, dis bad decisions, unhealthy choices um, versus um, healthier ones. And uh, that got reshared loads of places as well. And people were telling me, oh yeah, I used to drink and party a lot and now I ride my bike and I love it and I'm, I'm obsessed. It seems to be a common story. Yeah. So I think, and people like to see things that they can relate to, I suppose. And it's not, it's not like I did anything exceptional either. It was just, I replaced, you know, anybody could do it. You know, anybody can just, you know, start, you know, go out and do some exercise instead of downing these <laughs> photos were you already on the irish squad by then or was this sort of before when you no were, no i you wasn't getting into cycling racing no i i'm pretty sure the first transformation posted it i wasn't on i wasn't on the squad or i wasn't i think that was i it might have been close to around that time it's, see the thing is my instagram only started i opened at the end of 2016 and then it was 2017 when basically all this stuff started happening so it was it was um I had a lot of content as well during that point and I think the growth happened as well because there was a story happening mm. like right as I was posting it you know people who started following me were like this girl's just a commuter she likes cycling and then I was telling people that I was trying out for the national squad and I was learning how to ride on a track and I've broken my collarbones, the first accidents I've ever had. You know, I documented everything. Um, so I think part of that, people might have shared my account and said that it was interesting to follow. And that's nice. <laughs> so. Yeah, I guess that's, you know, that's the success of re reality TV and things like yeah. that. Isn't it? You've, yeah. you've got a journey yeah. that people can invest in. Yeah, so it was, it was nice. And I really enjoyed sharing it all. I feel like it's, it's like a diary. It's like a public diary that I've just been um, documenting everything for the past three years now. Do you ever so, just scroll back yourself because it's like a diary? I do sometimes, I do. And, you know, my, my style of Instagram has changed quite a bit probably since the beginning. But, um, yeah, I mean, I like to share what I'm passionate about. And, like, it does change and morph. Like, obviously, I've moved away from the, the road racing and I'm more focused on track now. So... Uh, I know like less people are are involved in track as well so I'm probably narrowing my audience to a little bit but um I don't know people people still seem to be invested in what I'm doing which is really nice because I yeah. mean I don't know <laughs> I don't think it's that special half the time but people people seem to be entertained yeah and do you remember the first time you did get contacted by a brand or anything like that because of your Instagram um do I remember the first time oh wow I, I think I think one of the first brands was, um, and I don't know whether I contacted them or they contacted me, uh, it was like the heavy pedal. It was like a fixed gear kind of multicolored kit. Okay. Um, do you remember? Because I remember fixed gear, like the fixed gear scene was quite yeah. big a few years ago. So I used to follow a lot of their accounts and I thought all oh, the kits were really cool. Um, 
I think they were one of the first to send me a free a free jersey and shorts or something like that and I was like yes <laughs> amazing <laughs> delighted um but yeah uh yeah and it all kind of evolved from there I was I had I've had some good support in especially like product support as well from certain brands in terms of stuff for my bikes and I mean equipment's not cheap especially if you're trying to compete at a high level mm-hmm. and on the like the track like wheels one disc wheel for three grand you know it's it's <laughs> yeah it's big if i didn't have that yeah if i didn't have that support it would have made this extremely difficult if it may be not maybe impossible so um i'm very thankful to have found brands that want to support me in, in my journey and what are some of the biggest improvements you've noticed in that kit that you've got like which kit has made the biggest difference to your cycling program? oh on track you mean whatever whatever yeah, um, i mean no pins has been great for me i uh the their speed skin suit is fast <laughs> um they they've done a lot of research into you know aerodynamics and mm-hmm. testing out different materials and different like textures so their skin suit is very fast um i obviously disc like disc wheels like it, i remember when <laughs> we did one of our first um uh, C like UCI C1, uh, which is um, just a, a level down from say a World Cup. So Cycling Ireland wouldn't fund, <clears throat> don't fund riders to go to these. You have to fund them yourselves, and you have to use your own equipment. So I remember, <clears throat> excuse me, going to one of them, and I didn't have, I didn't have a rear disc wheel. I didn't have, I, I honestly, I'm not even sure what whose wheels I was using, but there were some really entry level spokes. Um, racing against some of them like world championship riders in the in the bunch, and I'm new on this equipment that is not like if anybody does track. You know the difference between riding a rear disc and riding a spokey. Probably is probably a clincher as well. Um, so it was so hard, and then I remember. I was able to borrow a disc wheel for another round and instantly I was like, oh man, I can actually sit in the bunch now and I'm not <laughs> absolutely gassed. <laughs> so yeah, equipment, wheels, especially for track, I think wheels is probably one of the, the, the biggest components. I mean, obviously a track bike is quite simple generally, obviously lighter, stiffer bikes. Uh, the frame that I've, I bought myself was um, Bike Technologies an Australian brand and it's quite small but it's it's a good frame um high end so it's uh that's made a big difference as well because I was on an aluminium um BMC um at the initial stages of my sprinting um so that's the bike's quick anyway (laughs) yeah yeah, people say it's not all about the bike but sometimes it just is isn't it (laughs) yeah I mean yeah you can only get so much out of equipment but I, I think I mean, most of the work, I would prefer to do all of the work first and then go look for the, those extra percentages in equipment rather than have the best bike in the whole world and then have to actually train <laughs> to find anything extra. So, yeah, at the moment, my bike's pretty much right up there, though. So I guess and I have it, to do that And it's pretty now. much all track for you at the moment now as well. Um, it is, yeah. I, I moved away from road pretty much when I was full-time focused on, on the team pursuit. Um, so that was 2018 up until uh, mid 2019, I was full-time focused on team pursuit. I did some road racing when we had a chance, but it was hard because like we had to learn how to be a world-class team pursuit um, team. And uh in in a very short period of time so we would just be out in new Yorker for months training together and trying to be uh, trying to be a better team and that didn't leave much room for uh doing more road but to be honest i was never not that i wasn't a fan of ro- i just <laughs> kind of knew what my strengths and weaknesses were and i would have been told through the talent transfer and through the high performance coaches that I was more of a sprinter than an endurance rider. So you'd see that in the numbers and I'm quite uh, number focused, I suppose. 
so I would see, and I would always, I'd compare myself to my, to my teammates who were, had bigger engines than I had in terms of like time trials and climbing. So whilst I was faster than them for say all the shorter durations, so a lap, a lap 500 meters and 750 meters, I was faster. But anything after that, they were like, she's dead. Uh, so, so I mean, that, that, that was, that's just how I work. I, my physiology is more, more fast twitch than slow twitch. And uh, all the aerobic training in the world wasn't getting my FTB very high. <laughs> so play to your strength. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Are you enjoying it? You uh, get, are you getting, you're not just doing it for the numbers. Are no, you? I am enjoying it. I am enjoying it. I really, really, I think moving into the sprint scene, like pure sprint now in the last year, I've, I feel like I've found my niche. Um, mm. It, I love the gym. I, I, and I feel like maybe a lot of cyclists don't like the gym. Yeah. I love the gym. Yeah, 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 yeah. I absolutely love it. I love, you know, trying to lift more weight and feeling strong and powerful. I never felt that way when I did road racing, you know, I would have been uh, about five to six kilos lighter than I am now. Very skinny. I uh, didn't feel strong. I didn't, just didn't really feel that strong. So I prefer the sprint scene where I can just go into the gym or go into the track and all the efforts are just full gas, yeah. you know, full gas power. Um, it suits me more than that kind of long enduring pain, <laughs> like time trialing. <laughs> that for me. <laughs> and where you're at with it now. So, what are your goals coming up? Goals for the future? Um, yeah. So, it's hard. I was supposed to try and get a lot of racing in this year to learn. There's a lot to learn when it comes to sprint on the track in terms of um, ta tactics and learning how to how to race one on one with another sprinter. But um, there hasn't been any international racing. So, I, the only thing that I got to do this year was the national championships. So. I did the sprint and the 500 meter time trial and that was fine. I, um, I, I, I did what I needed to do there and won, but it, it, I would like to represent Ireland as a sprinter internationally. Um, and in order to do that, I need to prove myself um, at a, you know, an international race, get some results, but there, there just hasn't been any. Yeah. So hopefully um, 2021 will be a better year and that there will be some opportunities for me. Um, <clears throat> but I'm enjoying it anyway. <laughs> so I'll just keep pushing on with the training and hope, hopefully there will be more racing next yeah. year. And has it, I mean, has it affected your mood or your love of it or just like anxiety levels this year with, with COVID, you know, I've, I've spoken um, to a couple of pro riders who had like the Olympics scheduled yeah. here and, and deep people have reacted to it so differently. It's quite yeah. interesting. Some people have been um, excited almost to have an extra year of training that's put them yeah. in, a, in a stronger position and others have entered a bit of a black hole and, and been fighting that dark dog, you know? Yeah, I think it's hard because there's probably two different types of athletes and some purely just do this for the racing and they love racing and that's what they want to do and then there's others who like like myself I feel I just I like training I like pushing myself so I don't necessarily need the competition to keep wanting to get better um that's a nice addition and it, as much as I you know I don't like a lot of pressure it's also nice when you push yourself through competition because you get so much satisfaction out of I guess you know showing everyone what you've been working on it's like yeah. I feel like a race is like a presentation in work you know you don't really look forward to it but that's how I feel about it but once you get it over and done with you're like yes that was great loved it got to show that's everyone really what I could do analogy <laughs> yeah I like that. I like that. And I, get, I mean, I mean it's, it's hard to ask people too much about the future at the moment because it is so uncertain and it is so unknown. Yeah. But what would be like your biggest cycling dream come true? The like, biggest? Yeah. Oh, God. Um, I mean, the biggest competition would be the Olympics. Now, whether or not I have the capability of qualifying <laughs> a spot for the Olympics, it remains to be seen. I don't know. It's, it's quite tough. The qualification process is 
um, a bit cutthroat. It's, um, you know, there's limited numbers and generally speaking, bigger nations as well uh, have an easier time getting qualifying spots because say, it, say for sprint, if you qualify a team sprint, you automatically get a sprint spot and a Kieran spot as well. It's quite complicated. So, but it means potentially bigger nations get spots over say a smaller nation who might only have one or two riders. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, that, that'd be a big, that'd be amazing. <laughs> but yeah. It's not really the end goal. Um, I, I would just like to get the most out of myself um, and feel like that is as fast as I could go. And that's, that is, that was the peak of my athletic ability and I did everything I could to be the fastest I could be. And if, if that means that only, I only do, you know, if that's only a national championship level at this point, then I'm like, that's, that's as good as it's going to get. That's fair enough. Yeah, pretty damn good, let's face it. Um, so I know. Yeah, sorry, what was that? So I'll just, I'm just, my, I don't really, I don't like putting, you know, a target in mind because you know, I really don't know. I'm just trying to get the most out of myself each, each, each month, each day even. Um, and wherever that, wherever that takes me, it takes me. Um, do you have a it. vision beyond those peak years? Do you think cycling will always be a part of your life from now um, on? Or do you think that you'll swap it for another obsession? I don't know. <laughs> if I'm being really honest, I do have a tendency to kind of, not, not that I get bored, but I, I lose, I, I get less excited about things as time goes on. And I do tend to kind of drift into different things. So a part of me thinks that I might end up getting into like CrossFit or something like that yeah. <laughs> and trying to go to the CrossFit games. I don't know. Um, that's, that's, uh, that has crossed my mind. I love cycling my bike though. So it would be nice to always have that as something that I do to enjoy and not necessarily compete in. Just yeah. ride my bike at the weekend and go on coffee spins. Which and the good thing about a bike as well, as you mentioned right at the very, very beginning, it's a transport as well, isn't it? So even yeah. if you're not racing it, I suppose you can still just use it. 100% around. I will. If, I, if I'm back in the office job, I will be commuting in and out of work, guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Right. Ola, I'm just going to give you some quick fire questions now to wrap up. Oh, okay. Woo. So no explanations needed. You don't need to go into any further detail or give any background if you don't want to. Um, okay. But some stuff maybe that people don't know so much about you. So first of all, how many tattoos do you have? How many tattoos? I have a full sleeve and I have a tattoo on my ribs as well. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Down here. Um, Down here, yeah. How many pairs of cycling shorts do you own? Too many. Oh, 30? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe more. <laughs> I've never counted. <laughs> oh, get them on eBay. What's the most yeah. expensive bit of cycling kit that you own? Aside from your actual bike. Um, do you mean kit that I wear or just any? Anything, anything cycling related, but not the bike. Um, probably the skin suit. Yeah. Or parameters no the skin suit's more expensive i think the skin suit retails at 350 pounds wow yeah um sorry parameters would be more than that <laughs> the parameters <laughs> they're a couple of grand i don't know <laughs> parameters are a couple of grand, grand yeah parameters don't know what i'm thinking yeah um netflix guilty pleasure oh god guilty pleasure i've been watching a lot of big mouth <laughs> Have you ever seen that? No. It's I've very funny. That. What is yeah, it? Yeah, Big Mouth. I said like no a... details needed. Now I'm like, give me the details. Yeah, yeah. It's a cartoon. It's about adolescence. It's very funny. Um, <laughs> I just started last night watching Sex Education. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a similar vein, but it's a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, it is funny. Um, edible tasty treat of choice. Um, I, oh God, anything sweet. And I, I've been eating a lot of uh, anything, anything that's vegan in a cake now, I'll eat it. So <laughs> vegan cakes is a tip. Yeah, vegan cakes. Yeah. Um, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you started cycling? Most oh, God. Thing. That I wish I knew when I started cycling. Oh, um, 
always make sure, no, this is going to sound rude, but always make sure to not wear underwear under bib shorts. <laughs> That's a classic. That's a classic. Yeah. Don't do that. You will be in pain. <laughs> you remember first being told that as well? Were you just like, what are I you was doing? shocked. I was like, what do you mean? And then it all made sense. And instantly I was like, oh, this is more comfortable. I understand. Yeah. So much better. <laughs> yeah. Amazing, Orla. All right. Well, I'm not going to keep you any longer. I'll let you get okay. on the final of your weekend. But thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. Thanks for having me. Right. <laughs> Hope you have a great day. <laughs> Bye. All right. Bye. Thanks for watching. I really hope you loved that giggly chat with Chatterbox Orla Walsh. She is so entertaining and a phenomenal story, a phenomenal backstory that's on one hand so relatable, but on the other hand, so fascinating. Let us know what you thought about it in the comments below. And if you'd like to see us interview someone else for Ride to Unite, just get in touch.